Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome back. This is week three, and uh, we're uh, going to get going on making our main presentations for the, for the month. Um, everybody who turned in their uh, plan to me uh, by last night should have it back. I, uh, I was uh, up this morning, and I was able to go through all of the plans and get them back to people. So most, I was very pleased with them. They were very detailed. A lot of you uh, were on track. So I think uh, this group gets it. I think we're going to have a, an easy time of it. So what we want is to take a lot off your plate this month, this week, and let you just concentrate on the main assignment, creating the presentation. Uh, it's a huge task. You're gonna go from beginning to end from the script or from the, from, the, from the plan. Hopefully you'll write a script. You don't have to write a script, but it, it helps. I, I find that very helpful in doing a voiceover. But uh, you write a script, you'll voice it, you'll record your voice. I want you to all start with the audio. Don't start with the slides, start with the audio. Make sure that you've got your complete three to four minute uh, audio narrative created. And then uh, choose the slide program that you want and uh, uh, we'll add the audio to that and add visuals. And uh, there are a lot of choices. Uh, we've talked about PowerPoint. I know a lot of you are going to use PowerPoint. Uh, if you don't want to use PowerPoint, there are a lot of alternatives, and we're going to talk about that this week. But I want a complete presentation by the end of the week. I want uh, the audio in place, and I want the slides in place. Uh, and um, um, so that's a lot to get done in a week. We don't want to have you doing lots of other things. So we've lightened the reading. There's still some reading that we have to do. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. And uh, we have made the discussion board not a graded assignment for this week. So if you look at the discussion board, you'll find that what we're doing with it this week is to turning it into a kind of a sounding board for everybody. Uh, I've posted some videos to watch and some notes and some tips. And we're hoping that you guys will pass tips back and forth to each other if you find a, um, uh, an audio program or a, a, a presentation program that you like and you wanna um, share it with the other students, you can do that. If you wanna get some feedback early on your, vo your voiceover before you finish and move on to the slides, you can post it and get feedback from classmates. And this week's discussion board, the 3.3 discussion board is gonna stay open for a full two weeks. It's not gonna close down on Sunday. It's gonna stay open to the end of the class. And so what we're hoping everybody does is that at the end of the week, after you turn in your uh, finished presentation to me for a grade, you'll also post it in 3.3 and ask for feedback from your classmates. Now, this doesn't always work. It's a, it's a voluntary thing for other students to give you feedback, but um, it is a valuable thing that uh, is very helpful. And the best way to ensure that you get feedback is that you participate and give other people feedback as well. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later next week, but this is the week that you're gonna get everything going. And so there's just a little bit more reading. There's some in um, uh, Slideology and one of the uh, uh, chapters that we're reading in Slideology was Nancy talking about what she wanted presentations to do. She wants you to make an impact with your content. She wants you to create multimedia and drama so you capture people's attention. You don't wanna just you know, uh, lay out facts in and of themselves. You wanna tell a story and you wanna add drama to that story. And again, we wanna focus in on the audience. Uh, there is a reason that I keep telling you that you have to pick a specific company that you're, you're, you're pitching to. Even if you invent that company, you have to have something very specific in mind. And uh, it should be even that you're differentiating one company from another, such as you could make a different presentation uh, presenting to Riot Games versus Blizzard Games. So uh, depending on the company that you chose, you're going to tailor what you have to say to them because you know that audience and you know how to reach them and you know how to, how to talk to them, how to, how to uh, affect them, how to make them laugh, how to make them uh, get on your side and so forth. So you, 
uh, that was a huge part of the research. You needed to figure out who that company was. And most of you spent the time thinking about who, who you wanted to pick for your own sake. Like, oh, who do I want to work for? But in order to make this persuasive, you have to flip that on its head and you have to ask yourself, who do they want to hire? What is the kind of employee they're looking for? And how can I tell them that I am that sort of employee? So that was the sort of research that I was hoping you were engaging in last week. Now that you know who that audience is, you're going to use that power that you have to persuade them so that you know that you're talking to them with confidence, knowing who they are. Um, we want to tell stories. Again, we don't want to just string facts and figures together. And uh, this is something we need to deal with. I mean, I'm going to talk about it in a second, but in essence, what you're doing is you're delivering your resume. And your resume is just a text document of facts and figures. If you simply read your resume as your, as your uh, presentation, it'd be like a boring PowerPoint. So I'm asking you to take that resume and turn it into a story to figure out who you are and to describe who you are to a specific audience. So you have to figure out enough about yourself and the development of you and your skills that you can turn that into a story that we want to hear. And then once you have the story, you're going to come up with visuals that help us understand. As you're describing your story, what are the images that are going to help us understand what's going on? So show, don't tell. And there's a huge part of that uh, in that a lot of the things that you say have actually become kind of cliched, cliched language. So when you say it, you might not have a huge impact. And that's where combining it with visuals really does matter. So I have an exercise that I want us to engage in called visualizing ideas. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, dump out right now and uh, go to my browser. And um, I have created for us a Google Doc, a shared page in which I have created um, uh, some spaces. Now, if you don't know what a Google Doc is or a shared document is, everyone who clicks on the link in the chat box is gonna be connected to the very same Google document word page. This is, this is a word doc or it's a word document that I've created. And uh, what I've done here is I've created, I've come up with a bunch of terms, the kind of words that you would use in describing yourself, the kind of thing language that might be in your resume. And it's the kind of language that people hear all the time and it becomes uh, a little worn, you know, that it doesn't really impress people to say that you're a problem solver or that you think out of the box. So now you have the opportunity to not only say that about yourself, but to combine it with an image. So now here's the challenge. Here's the, here's the uh, task that I'm putting forward to you all. I want you to pick one or more of these words. This is all voluntary. You know, it's not for grade or anything, but you can do all five or you just pick one, but pick a word that's a word you might use to describe yourself. And then think about what is the exact right image to use in this circumstance. And when I say in the circumstance, it means you are creating a presentation. So it speaks to your own um, artistic vision, your own uh, artistic sophistication, the images that you pick. And you're speaking to a particular audience. You're talking to the head of Disney. You're talking to you know, the, uh, a lead programmer at a, at, a, at a video game company. What is their level of sophistication? So certainly, if you wanted to choose eager, there would be some you know, cartoon meme on the internet that you could pick and, and everybody would smile and it would be the, the most common that you would use. But is it the best choice to say that that's what you would use to communicate to this specific person in this instance? So I want you to think about that, knowing that the choices that you make reflect upon you and that's all part of this test. You're trying to persuade someone you're persuading them with the choices that you make. So the way this works is I've got a number of words here. They're the kind of words that might be on your resume. And I want you to choose one of these words. And then I want you to pick an image that goes with it that is your choice for an image to illustrate it. 
specifically in this kind of presentation. Now, uh, because we're uh, um, all together here, we have to we have to be a little bit um, uh, we have to work with rules because since everybody is connected to this page and everybody has full editing uh, uh, privileges, any one of you could select all and hit delete and wipe out the entire page. So we need to not step on each other. And as more of you get on place here, you're gonna see different color um, uh, cursors. Each of you has your own unique color and your cursor describes where you have set up. So if you have your cursor in someone else's space, you can wipe out what they do. And what I've done is I've created a number of boxes here. And in the small box, I let you claim a box. And then I want you to put your cursor in the big box and that's where you'll put the picture. So I want to show you an example. I've already done one here. So I chose this image of a guy standing on a mountain cliff looking into the horizon to say adventurous. So I chose a painting. It's a kind of a romantic painting. You know, it expresses who I am. This is my vision of the way I would want to say things. Um, so I'm going to choose another one here. So I've, I've, I've cleared, claimed the space. So this is how we're going to, you know, uh, do uh, uh, traffic management here. If you want to participate, choose a column under the word that you're choosing, that you're doing. And we have, again, plenty of spaces. So not everybody has to be on the top row. But wherever you want to be, be underneath the word that you want to, to illustrate and claim that space by writing your name there in the small box. Once you've written your name in the small box, put your cursor in the larger box. So right now, I put my cursor in the box top box under team player. So I'm going to choose an image for team player. And I'll show you how this works. Now this being a Google Doc, they built Google search straight into the page. It's pretty cool. If I go up to insert image, search the web, then part of this page becomes a Google image search. Now, uh, when you guys are searching these terms, your your probably your first thought is just to put in the actual term itself. Now, because of the Google algorithm, it's going to give us the most common image. And in this case, worldwide, soccer is the most used team. And so we have lots of images of people playing soccer. And that's what people think of as team members. And uh, if that works for you, it's fine. But I, I, for the most part, I don't want you to be that guy that chooses the first Google image. You know, there's probably a million images here. So you can, you can uh, search for the one that, that says something about you. And you can be specific. And you don't necessarily have to just search on the, on the word here. I put in team player, but I have an idea in my head for an image that I think is going to speak, speak to this choice. And so I don't need necessarily to put team player in. I'm going to put in sky dive formation. And I'm going to think about these guys who jump out of airplanes and then get together before they pull their parachutes. And to me, that's something like team effort. And I'm going to choose an, a dynamic image. Here's one that I like. So when I select the image I want, it gets a blue check mark on it. And I have a box at the bottom that says, insert. There's a button here that says insert. When I click on insert, the image is going to go into the large box. So that's what I'm asking you to do. I want you to go through, search the web, think about what is the image that's going to speak for you and put it in there. So Devin just did uh, a, a little um, a graphic for problem solver. That's an excellent choice. So I'm going to let you guys work on this. I'm going to keep back to the lecture, but you can be working on this while I'm talking. I'm sure you can multitask. And those of you that are watching the video uh, know that um, uh, this is linked to in the um, chat box or in, in the, in the uh, um, uh, uh, the discussion board. So you'll be able to participate. It's called Visualize Ideas. So I've got a couple of movies that I put in place, a couple of links of interesting things, and I have the term Visualizing Ideas. 
So if you click on this, you're gonna to go to the exact same page that we were just showing, and that's gonna be up all week. So you guys will all have the opportunity to participate and discuss how each one of you did and everything. So I'm gonna let you get guys keep going on that and uh, uh, I'll get back to uh, what I was saying here. So visualizing ideas, we'll come back and look and see how everybody did. Um, so the, the first task in figuring out how to get from your plan to a presentation is to figure out what is the story that you want to tell? How are you going to tell the story? You, we know from last week that there's a million different ways to tell a story. And so uh, what is the structure? What is the strategy? Uh, what works the best? And there are a number of ways to think about it. You know, most of you are going to find that just working chronologically will be the best. You know, I first got interested in video games when I played a Nintendo at age five and, you know, just work your way up. Uh, so if your life makes perfect sense and has flowed logically, then telling it chronologically makes sense. But some of you have, have uh, had different and parallel careers. Some of you have had different things going on in your life and you had to start over. So there may be different ways to tell your story that matter the most. And remember, you're not telling the story for your own sake. You're telling the story to your dream audience. So what is the, uh, what is the information they need to hear? You know, if you had a lot of bad habits in high school uh, and, and that you had to overcome them, well, uh, that may be something you need to mention, but in terms of impressing the uh, audience that you're talking to, the overcoming the bad habits is much more important than describing in detail the bad habits themselves. So in terms of telling storytelling, it's really a matter of what you give weight to and what you abstract over. You know, the importance of storytelling is figuring out a certain amount of detail here gives me flavor and, 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 and truth and grounding. And then other things I wanna go through in a, in a kind of faster fashion in order to make the storytelling uh, flow with a good rhythm and pace. So it is an issue about how to figure out how to tell your story. And to that end, that's why I posted a couple of those movies in the discussion board. Uh, there's two movies that I think will be helpful to you to watch. The first one is an actual TED talk by a fellow called Simon Sinek. It's called Start With Why. And so, as I mentioned before, essentially what you're doing with this presentation is taking your resume and presenting it. But your resume is a document of facts and figures. It's, it's, it's a, um, you know, it's a data document and it's things that you've done. It's important to know. And we understand the structure of resumes. We all send each other resumes and we know how to read them. We don't expect them to be full of stories and, 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 and uh, a drama, but that's why they're not necessarily the great basis for a script. But essentially, if you're presenting yourself and your skills to a dream employer, that's what you're saying. But instead of reading your resume, which would be, we agree, boring, Simon Sinek says, start with why. Your resume is a series of uh, lists of what you did. You know, I went to this school, I joined the army, I worked at this job, then I worked at this job, then I went to this school, uh, so on and so forth. A list of events. But Simon Sinek says, instead of saying what you did, go through those same items and tell us why you did it. What was the intrinsic motivation that got you to go to music school or join the army or start your own business? That's the basis of a real bit of drama and, and, and interest. We want to know why you were motivated to do these things. And in talk about th talking about them, you reveal a lot of inner truth about yourself. So you can look at your resume as a starting point for how to um, tell your own story. But if you flip it on its side and tell us why you did all those things in the resume and not just what you did, 
you're going to find that that becomes a really interesting story that we all want to hear. So I encourage you all to watch the Simon Sinek video. I think you'll find that it solves a lot of problems for you in, in, in figuring out how to tell your story. Now, again, some of you have had much more complicated stories. And that's where the second video comes in. It's, this won't be for everybody, but it's interesting. It's called How to Structure a Video Essay. It's a, by a fellow named Tony Zo. And what he's doing is he's looking at the Orson Welles documentary, F for Fake. And the interesting thing about F for Fake is that it has more than one subject. It doesn't have two subjects. It doesn't have three subjects. It doesn't have four subjects. It has five different topics that it talks about. And instead of doing one fully and then stopping and doing the next one, it introduces each one of these topics and then jumps back and forth from, from point to point. It, it tells the stories in parallel. And that creates drama and interests. And that's a storytelling technique that you can use yourself. Uh, you have to think about it and you have to have a life that is um, disparate enough to, 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 to handle multiple events. But if you're exactly the kind of person who started out thinking you're going to do one thing and then you went into another career and then you had a third career and then you came back and realized that you really wanted to do the first thing, but that uh, what you did in your second career completely colored that, then this is the kind of way that you want to tell your story, that you're really going to have to deal with the, the complexity of life. And it isn't that complex because uh, what Tony Zo shows us that we can all re relate to is that this structure of telling a story is something that uh, is at the heart of the TV show South Park, that cartoon about little kids in Colorado. And every single 22 minute episode of South Park has three separate plot lines that run in parallel through its length that then connect together at the end. That is the structure for storytelling for every single episode of South Park. And if you understand that, then you understand that that can be a way to tell a story. It's not, a, it's not the way to tell every story. You have to have the right event, but it's a useful thing to know. And even if it doesn't work for this time around, it's a structure for telling stories that you might think of next go round. Um, so one of the bits of reading that we are having you do this week is about how to appeal to an audience because each of you has a different way of relating to the audience depending on what your relationship is and people have been standing up in front of audiences for thousands of years and aristotle or the ancient greek uh was so into it that he defined the three pillars of public speaking. Uh, public speaking was a kind of entertainment back then. And he classified the ways that speakers related to audiences into three different types. And we still find that useful today. So depending on what your relationship to the material and to the audience is, you have one of three ways that you can relate to them. The first way is ethos. The audience is going to believe you because you, they, uh, you appeal to their trust or credibility. You come across as a believable person. You have a sort of Abe Lincoln, Tom Hanks quality about you and that uh, people will be willing to trust your word. Now, this also comes along with credentials. You know, if you're a doctor and you've got, you know, several different um, degrees after your name or you've, you know, you're uh, the author of a book or you you, you want a Nobel Prize, those kinds of appellations will give you trust as well. So there are a number of ways to be a trustworthy person. You can have honors and, and uh, 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 biographical uh, depth. You can be a trustworthy personality. You can also just have a lived experience. You know, you don't necessarily have to be a doctor to talk about Cancer, you can be an 11 year old girl. And if you stand up there and say, well, I wanna to talk to you about cancer because I watched my mother die for the last three years. That lived experience gives you credibility. 
Doesn't mean you're a doctor. Doesn't mean you know, you know, the technical words for, you know, scientific stuff or anything, but you will have gained that credibility because of your lived experience. And we already know that using your voice in a certain way with hail can let people know that you are speaking authentically from your heart. So that's a relationship that you can have with the audience that they will believe you because of uh, a trust relationship. Another kind of relationship is pathos. That's the appeal to emotion. So if you're a young student who doesn't have uh, a whole lot of experience and you're experiencing, you're, you're applying for a job to someone who's been around for 40 years, maybe you're not gonna impress them with your resume, but maybe you'll impress them with your enthusiasm. Maybe you will impress them with your longing that you will remind them of the person that they used to be, that your emotional appeal can make you a connection. And there are a lot of different emotions. For the most part, if you want people to like you, you're dealing with happy emotions, but the appeal to pathos can run different ways and deal with different emotions. And the third way you can appeal to an audience is through logic. Uh, logos is the appeal to logic. And you would structure your argument knowing that the audience is going to be skeptical. And every time you state a fact, you say where that fact came from. And every time you, you, know, you post an image, you, you let us know exactly what the particulars are. So you use lots of footnotes, you use lots of um, uh, backing research, and, and uh, you're, you're trying to build an airtight case, assuming the audience is looking for a gap in your logic. Uh, if your logic fails, then your argument fails. But if your logic holds up, then the audience is going to accept what you have to say. So an appeal to logic talks about certain kinds of material that can be proven one way or the other. You can't do a logical argument about something that's basically personal opinion or emotion, but it, you can do a logical argument about uh, things that exist and, and facts that happen and um, uh, um, um, processes that are true or not true. So each one of these has their own, you know, uh, uh, additional points to it. In ethos, the audience asks, or does the audience respect you? You have to be somebody that they're looking up to and that they will accept as a credible narrator. Uh, does the audience believe you're of good character? Does the audience believe that you're generally trustworthy? Uh, and a lot of this is just the way you come off. Sometimes people can be absolutely truthful, but they give off the appearance of being uh, you know, um, a slick or sales type person. And, uh, you know, then you just have to work with that. But for the most part, people who are sincere show it and other people recognize it. Does the audience believe that you're an authority on this speech topic? And again, authority becomes a relative term. Sometimes it means, uh, you know, uh, credentials based on learning or, or uh, society honors or something. And sometimes it just means lived experience. Ethos or pathos. Uh, do your words evoke feelings of love, sympathy, fear? Notice that when you use pathos, it doesn't always going to be happy emotions. It can be negative emotions, but you have to be careful with that. Do your visuals evoke feelings of compassion or envy? Does your characterization of the competition evoke feelings of hate and contempt? Now, this is not something that any of you are going to be dealing with in this presentation, but the appeal to pathos is quite often, and we just came out of the political season, and practically 100% of political ads are based on negative advertising, which is that you don't promote yourself, you denigrate the other side. So you're, you're using emotion to get people to think ill of your competition. Now, I don't want you guys to think that you're in competition with each other at all. When you speak for your three or four minutes, don't even mention things like, oh, I know there are a lot of other people you could hire. This is your three or four minutes, and that thought never entered that, come, that other person's mind until you put it there. So don't even think about other people. Just focus in on yourself, and then you'll have the spotlight all to yourself. But if you are using pathos to uh, um, compete with someone, you do have the ability not only to promote good feelings about yourself, 
but bad feelings about the others, other persons. And that can be uh, very powerful. It also means that it's um, very dangerous. Sometimes it can redound upon against you. Uh, logos, uh, it's almost like you're building a legal uh, case in court, like a summary of a lawyer at the end of a court trial. Does your message make sense? Is your message based on facts, statistics, and evidence? Will your call to action lead to the desired outcome that you promised? So everything you say leads up to that final takeaway at the end. Because of everything I said, you should hire me. Because of everything I've said, you should buy this product. Because of everything I've said, you should join this cause. So whatever it is you're trying to convince the audience of, your argument has led completely up to whatever the takeaway is going to be. And so a Logos argument has a power of being seeming inevitable if it's convincing enough to the people who are watching it. But again, another issue with Logos based arguments is that they still have to be dramatic. You cannot bore people. And a lot of times a Logos based argument being based on facts and statistics starts to sound like just reading facts and that becomes boring. So remember that it still has to be a story. It still has to have drama for people to remember it. And these can overlap. You can have, uh, you can shoot for ethos and overlap and have a little bit of pathos and that can work. Uh, and it's often that you might have one or uh, two elements together. It's very rare that you have all three together, but if you do, you've absolutely won the argument. But it's very possible to have a logos and pathos-based argument, a logos and ethos-based argument, an ethos and pathos-based argument. They do overlap. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's uh, worth knowing, uh, you know, what those possibilities are, because this is something for you as the creator of the presentation to think about what is your relationship to the audience and how can I use these relationships to persuade? And at each point along the way, we have to think about how can we make this better? How can we improve this? And so next week is gonna be all about making the project better by feedback. But even this week, as we're working on component elements, if, you're, you, know, if you record your audio and you you want to get feedback before you go ahead and move on to the slides, you can post it in the discussion board and people will be able to give you uh, their feedback. So uh, that's it for the lecture. I wanted to go in and talk more about uh, some of the specifics. Before I do, let's come and see how people are doing. Uh, all right, we have uh, uh, an anime image for Eager from uh, Elise. Um, Adventurous, we have a rocket taking off. Yeah, that speaks to me. Um, team player, we've got a couple of guys hanging out. They look like they're uh, pretty bonded. So that's a pretty cool image from Brian. So if you guys want to keep working on that or you guys are watching on the video, uh, want to try to do it, uh, you know, we can carry all, all this on on the uh, discussion board as well. So I put a lot of this information in just to be helpful. And again, we, anybody who wants to post other information uh, can do it as well. Um, I have a link in here that uh, shows us lots of different online presentation tools. There's so many that I really can't go through them all. Uh, some are very well known. Some of them you've used before like um, uh, Prezi. Prezi, I don't think, is a great tool for this particular assignment. The, uh, the uh, trope of, of Prexi of zooming in and out of static uh, uh, slide areas uh, is interesting, but I don't think it's going to speak about who you are. Uh, but again, if you want to use Prezi, you may. There are lots of tools that are out there that people are used to. One of the things I want to warn people against is um, uh, uh, it, uh, my mind's going blank here. Uh, the animation one, loop, Luby Tube, Looney Tunes, or uh, uh, starts with an L. Uh, 
uh, it, it creates a lot of uh, pre-made animation for you. And they're, they're very fun, but the, uh, the problem is with the website, they become a bait and switch website. And while it's really easy to join and make a, uh, uh, a presentation, getting it back out can be a, a huge problem. They want to make, uh, they want to upsell you and make you join and, and pay them money in order to be able to share that tool. So, um, uh, Powtoons, Pow, I don't know what, uh, Powtoons I recommend against because they are a bait and switch type site. Uh, and, uh, you know, this has happened in the last year or so. So, uh, you know, we, we, we know that people like them. They create, you know, pre-made animations that are fun but uh, I don't like the way that they treat their customers. So uh, it, you need to be able to get your animations out of the file as well. So again, uh, the, the, the third party tool that we highly recommend is Adobe Spark. Uh, Adobe Spark, Adobe is uh, the company that creates the, the uh, uh, Creative Cloud Suite with Photoshop and After Effects and Illustrator and all that. They create those professional tools that we, we learn in, in uh, later classes. Adobe Spark is a free tool online and it, has, it works from their website. So you need to join their website and sign in, just use your same school credentials, but it's free to join. Uh, there's, there's no obligation or anything, but in joining up, they give you online storage space. So when you create files, your files live on the internet and you can get them in and out. And uh, they, there are three types of Adobe Spark files. One's called a social graphic, one's called a web page. Don't use those. The third is called a short video and that's what we're using as presentations. So if you wanna make an Adobe Spark presentation, choose short videos. They will record your audio. They have the ability to add uh, um, background audio if you like. They have pre-made art from Adobe that you can get stills and images. You can add your own images and so on and so forth. And they export as an MPEG-4 file. So that is very good, uh, useful and clean. Uh, it's simple to use. Uh, I don't think a lot of people are gonna have trouble getting started. Um, one of the things about a lot of these tools is that uh, uh, the more powerful they are, the harder they are to use. And that's certainly the case with PowerPoint. We like PowerPoint. We think PowerPoint is a terrific tool, but PowerPoint has been around so long and it has so many features that it has actually become a bit of an issue. Uh, PowerPoint has so many features now that they have to hide some of them. And some of the things that we really need you to use in PowerPoint, um, they hide, and so I have to I have to go through this right now just to show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to choose a template here and create uh, a file, and I'm going to create a, a title page, my brand, put my name on it, and I'm going to add a second slide. I'm going to call that slide two. And I'm gonna add another slide. I'll call that slide three. Um, pretty clever, huh? And I'm gonna add one more slide. I'm gonna call that slide four. So the way that you put audio on PowerPoint is that you put all of your audio on slide one. Now, the software doesn't come with manuals anymore. And so all these hidden items hidden options Microsoft doesn't tell you about. There's no one else that can tell you unless there's somebody like me in place that says, don't do that, do this. So a lot of you figure that when you make audio that you put audio for each slide on that slide. I do not want that. I want you to create a single contiguous three to four minute piece of audio that you will put on the first slide and it will start playing and it will play automatically through the entire presentation. Now, Microsoft does this, but there's some features that you have to turn on 
that they that aren't automatic and that's what I want to show you right now so in order to put audio on a slide you have to be on the slide that you're talking about so I want everybody to do their audio on slide one and you can come up to the insert menu choose insert audio and there's a recording button so Microsoft or PowerPoint has its ability to record its own audio this isn't fancy it's just a little tool here but I can hit the red dot, it starts recording. I hit the black dot, it stops recording. I can hit playback. So I'm gonna start recording now and I'm recording my voice right now as you guys are listening to me. So as if I was creating a three to four minute piece. And when I get the whole thing done, I can hit stop and insert and it puts a file on page one. Now, there are options that are available in PowerPoint that you would never see until you actually have audio to deal with. There are hidden audio options and you would never know about it unless you actually went ahead and put your audio in place. So I want you to put your entire three to four minute piece of audio on slide one and when you select it, when you have it highlighted here, suddenly there are two new menus that are available at the top here, audio format and playback. And if you select playback, you have the ability to have the audio file start automatically or in click sequence. I want you to start it automatically. I don't want you to make the audience click to engage the audio. So make sure that it says start automatically. And right below that, very important, play across slides. Now, if you did not click this, then the audio on slide one would never transfer over to the other slides. And you'd never know why, but um, it's very important that you do that. Now, once you've done those two things, you now have the ability to put audio all across the entire program. How do you do that? Well, once you create all the other slides that you want, uh, you can go up and create something called Run Record Slideshow. It's under the Slideshow menu. Record Slideshow is gonna go into playback mode and it's gonna automatically start playing the audio that I put in place on slide one, and it's gonna hold on slide one until I click and tell it to go forward. So as I listen to my audio, when I know I should go from slide one to slide two, I'm gonna click and it's gonna do it for me and it's gonna remember that point in the audio when it transitions. And I'm gonna go through the entire thing and I'm gonna tell it where all the sync points are. So I'm gonna hit record now. So I'm gonna start recording it goes now. into playback. I'm recording my voice right now. As you and I wanna go from slide one to slide two now. I was creating a three to four. Now to slide three. And when I get out of slide four. Down. And when I'm done, it asks me if I wanna save it. And I say yes. And now it has automatically taken my long piece of audio and put five seconds on slide one, two seconds on slide two, two seconds on slide three, two seconds on slide four. And if I don't like that sync, I can just go back and rerun record slideshow. And if I decide to add more slides, then I can go back and rerun slideshow. If I decide to move the slides around, I can go back and record slideshow. So I can do that as many times as I want and I can get the sync exactly the way I want. It's very powerful. It's a great feature of, of um, PowerPoint. And the only thing that's maddening is that they don't tell you that it's there. So I'm telling you that it's there. If you guys want to use PowerPoint, this is the way I want you to do it. I want you to have a single piece of audio on slide one and put it through. Now, that recording tool where you recorded your audio wasn't so fantastic, was it? I mean, you, know, uh, if, you could record, and if you got it wrong, all you could do is stop and start over again. And it won't take that long uh, to do if, if you mess it up. But I wanna show you Audacity. And we mentioned Audacity last week. And I have a link in here for getting Audacity. If, if you want to download Audacity uh, to your Mac or PC, it's free, it's open source software. There's a version for Windows, there's a version for Mac. It's really simple to use. Uh, if you're not on Mac or PC, I have links in here for iOS audio and, and Android audio. So. Uh, if you're using audio from uh, for your phone, I have some art articles in here for you using that as well. But if you're using a Mac or a PC, then uh, this is the interface for Audacity. And if you start recording, 
it will start taking what you say and you get a nice visual transformation. So you can tell if you're getting a good file recording by how wide and thick the audio is. And the really great thing about recording with Audacity is that um, you don't have to be perfect. If you make a little mistake, then uh, the easiest thing to do, let me, uh, let me make a mistake. Let's say I'll check that and I'll start new. And I'm going to start recording. And this is me telling the story of myself. And then, oh, I made a mistake. I was quiet there for several seconds and I left a gap. And therefore, when I want to go back and fix it, I can see immediately where that mistake is. If you don't speak, then there's no audio. And in fixing something, like maybe the mistake is just you saying, uh, or um, you want to get rid of those, the, the hems and haws, the kind of things we do. With Audacity, you can simply select that file, delete it, and it will play back right away. So uh, instead of having to do a four minute voiceover, perfect, and if it's not perfect, you got to do it completely over. With Audacity, you could start doing your recording. And every time you made a mistake, just give yourself a little space in there so you can find the mistake. And then start reading again. And you could go back and very quickly, you know, if you only made three or four mistakes, it'd just be three or four of these little cut and paste, you get rid of it, and then you'd have a perfect file. It's very easy to do. And then there are a lot of options for exporting. So you can export as an MPEG-3 file, you can export as uh, uh, MPEG-4 audio, WAV files, and so on and so forth. So you can get really good audio quality files out of Audacity. So even if you wanted to work in PowerPoint, you might want to record your audio in Audacity because it just works so much better. Now, beyond the choice of software, uh, one of the big uh, tips for getting a good audio recording is to be aware of where the microphone is. So if you're recording on your phone, it's common for us to keep the phone mashed up right against our face. If it's not sitting on our face, it's an inch away from our face. And we also have a sort of phone voice that's not so loud because we're speaking on the phone in the phone, the microphone on, on the, uh, the smartphone is right there, right at the mouth. Well, I want you to use your normal room voice. I want to hear you talking as if you're talking in the room. And the only thing that you need to do to get a good recording from that is take the phone away from your face and hold it back about three or four inches. With the microphone about three or four inches from your space, face, you can speak in a normal room tone and you won't overmodulate. Uh, simultaneously on your computers, uh, if you're using a laptop, for most laptops, the microphone on a computer, uh, on, a, on a laptop, is at the top of the keyboards, uh, right at the hinge, at the bot, you know, right where the where the screen folds down on a laptop. So it means it's in that back corner where the 90 degree angle forms. And if you're sitting upright at a lap at your desk speaking, you're probably about 30 inches or more away from the microphone, and you're not going to get a really great recording. So in order to just to sound better, lean in towards the keyboards and make sure your voice, you know, your, your mouth is a little more like 12 or 15 inches from the microphone, and you will get a really good recording. It's easy enough to do. And a lot of you, if you have external microphones, if you have uh, head mic setups that you choose for, say, uh, Xbox gaming and so forth, those work really well as well. And those are usually set up and can even work through um, uh, Audacity. If you have it set up for your, for your computer, uh, Audacity is very likely to, to find it and be able to let you use that as your recording microphone for Audacity. So, uh, these are just options that I want to give you guys out, out there and throw them out. Um, and so with that, I want to ask for some questions. I know you guys are using lots of different programs. You guys are wanting to do different things. 
Uh, does anybody have any questions for me? You guys are still there. I, yeah, I do have one question, Daryl. Sure. Um, on the audio recording, I know you said kind of three to four minutes is a target. Um, we're not going to be graded on if we go over correct. Well, um, you're going to be graded on trying to shoot for the target. So going a little bit over is fine. Going a little bit under is fine. I'm, I'm not really being hard nosed about that, but being oblivious to the target is not fine. You know, I don't want a nine minute recording. I don't want a 20 minute recording. You know, uh, that's a different kind of program. I mean, if I wanted you to do 20 minutes on yourself, I would tell you to do that. So when I say three to four minutes, that means that it governs the kind of storytelling that you do. And I want you to try to shoot for that range. And being oblivious of the timing is to mean that you're not paying attention as the author. And, and a real good tip is that one page double spaced is usually one minute of audio voiced over. So if you were to actually write it down ahead of time, writing something that's three to four pages will generally govern for the time. But certainly if you go to four and a half minutes, even five minutes, it's, it's not gonna be a problem. It won't be like you're, you're not gonna get uh, uh, lashed out. Now, if you, if you record five minutes and it sounds perfect, I'll tell you, don't change a thing. If you record five minutes and it feels too long to me, I will say for the week four, see if you can trim it a little. So I won't, I won't do it based on the, the hard instructions. I'll do it based on whether I think the, the, uh, the presentation works better at a shorter pitchier space pace or not. Oh, that's a great answer. That really clarified a lot of things, I'm sure. Okay, and uh, yeah, imagine that even on TV, you know, there's TV commercials that are 60 minutes and 30 minutes. They tell different stories. They often use same of the same material, but they, they know that they have to tell the story in a different way. So three to four minutes means that, you know, you can only talk so much about your formative years. And that, you know, and when you get to the middle of the story, you know, you need to be speaking for at least 30 seconds or 40 minutes about the acquisition of your skills and so on and so forth. You know, when we say that telling a story is the beginning, middle and end, we don't necessarily mean that it cuts down to 33% beginning, 33% middle, 33% end. It doesn't really work that way. It tends to cut down to, in most of these stories that we're talking about ourselves, that the intro is, 40 to 50 percent of the whole thing and that the middle is 25 to 30 percent of the whole thing and the end is usually 10 or 15 percent you know the end is basically a summation so you know uh, 30 seconds is plenty of time to get that done but uh you know they aren't equal in weight but when you have a time budget you know that you're spending x amount of time doing one thing or the other Uh, that was a great question. Have any more questions? Well, guys, okay, I'm going to so, uh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, no. Okay. So um, in order for us to do this assignment, we have to do, we have to do the 2.4. Well, I actually missed that day because I was, I was at a church event and I missed that. <laughs> Well, the truth is you're going to have to do 2.4, but you don't have to do it for me as an assignment. So if, if, if 2.4 is still outstanding, I want you to turn that in. But, but right now, your task is to spend the entire week giving me a completed presentation, which means the information that goes into that presentation, you're going to have to figure out. You're going to, have to figure it out now so you can go ahead and make this script and tell your story. Now, once you've actually created the, pre the presentation, 
mm-hmm. you could give me the plan after the fact. Next week or week four, you could give me 2.4, and it'll be, in, instead of being the plan before you made it, it'll be a review of what you already mm-hmm. did. But you're actually going to have to do that work. You just did do it last week. You're doing it right now. Okay. Did Thank you. Sure. Yes, sir. And, and the reason we wanted you to do the plan was so that you could get that work out of the way. It's hard enough to record your audio and it's hard enough to find slides and put media together. You know, if you're worrying about how, what your story is or, you know, what you did when you were 15, you know, uh, if you hadn't figured that out already, then that's just taking time away from time you could be working on doing multimedia. But if you didn't do it last week, got to do it this week. That's just the way the work goes. Anybody else? All right. Well, as I was going to say, I'm going to be around all week. If you guys have questions, if you have any technical issues, um, another thing I wanted to mention is if you have an older Android phone, there is uh, a program here called VoiceThread, which is not really sexy, but it works with a lot of older Android phones. So if, if that's something that you need to know about, then that's there and it's useful to you. Uh, and uh, if you need more information on that, I can, I can uh, help you through. So. Um, I'm going to be available. Anybody who has a question can just shoot me, you know, a uh, message in the feedback uh, questions on, on FSO or send me a text. Anybody that wants some help with working with any of the programs, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really happy to give you a call so we could just set up a timing where you could be at your computer and I could be on the phone and we could be a lot more productive that way. Most of the programs you're using, I'm familiar with, so I can talk you through things while you're doing them and it makes it a lot quicker. So if you need any of that help, I'm available all week as well. All right, last chance for questions. I'm gonna call it. All right, I want you guys to have fun this week. This is the week that you're being creative. This is the week you came here to Full Sail to be artists. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying you guys are artists. You're starting with a blank page and you're gonna end up with a finished show, you know, at. That, that's the ball game. That's what you came here to school to do. So I want you to enjoy it. it it's going to be challenging, but I think you're going to feel real good about what you've done because I know you're a smart crew and you got a lot of creative ideas and I can't wait to see what you can come up with. Night, everybody. Night, Daryl. Good night. Thanks. Night, John boy. <laughs> <laughs>